and you know, stacks, more, more sort of complex data structures. So we're doing the binary heap. And so the features of the binary heap are sort of represented in this table. So it is a data structure that supports the following operations, insert, find max, extract max, and there's an increase key operation which is very similar to insert. So think of it as you can insert anything, but you can only delete the maximum, okay? So it's not, you cannot arbitrarily delete an element, or it's not efficient to do so. So you cannot find with this data structure. And so the point of a priority queue is often you have items with various priorities and you're trying to find out the most important one. Sometimes this will be done for scheduling um, jobs in your operating systems or in a server, or let's just even say that like someone's running a store, they have a bunch of orders coming in. The priority is the one with like, you know, the earliest maybe deadline. And then deadlines might change, so then you update the priority. Okay, so that's a priority queue. So the idea of a binary heap, and it takes a little bit of, uh, you have to sort of think about this a bit to get used to it, it's that it's really just an array of objects. It's just an array of objects, but we will interpret the array as a tree. So conventionally A0 is empty, the children of A1 are A2 and A3, the children of A2 are A4 and A5, so essentially it's sort of level by level. You can think of the binary, the array, as having the elements of the heap level by level. There are no pointers. You only manipulate the indices to go to parents and children. Right? That was what um, it was about. And so <coughs> using sort of this math that keeps coming up over and over again, this formula, n divided by 2 to the i equals 1. So by this, you can argue that the heap has a maximum depth of log n. There are multiple ways of, of seeing this. So we interpret the array as a tree of depth log n, okay, right? <coughs> now the most important feature of a binary heap, so again, so this interpretation has nothing to do with the values, right? This is just saying this is how you interpret. The structure that we will maintain is that the key of the parent is always greater than the key of the children. And I say greater than equal to, a question comes up of what happens if they're equal, and you can usually, you know, you can break ties in any which way you want. So because the key at the parent is greater than the key at the child, obviously the maximum is always at the root of the tree. So finding the maximum is theta of one or O of one, right? Because you just have to look at the root. So the root always has the maximum element. So once you have this sort of the key to understanding how binary heaps work, <coughs> Sorry. So the main operations that modify the heap. So the finding obviously, the find max doesn't modify the heap, right? You just look at the maximum and that's it. It's the inserting and the deleting that change the object. And so the idea is when, it, when you change the object, so this is going to come up both in binary search trees and binary heaps and actually in many other data structures which is you have certain operations, let's go back to this, that don't change the data structure, like a find. But then you have the operations that actually change the data structure. So the way to think about the design of the data structure is done so that these operations are fast. So that's how you design it. But then the problem is that you have to figure out how to insert and delete. And so the way you would do it is you insert and delete in sort of the obvious way possible. Like if it's an array, you just add it at the end, or you just swap, you know, if you want to delete something, you swap at the end and decrement the size. But every time you do that, the invariant gets broken. So um, when you insert or delete, you break this property. Does that make sense? And so then, the point is to do a series of operations to fix the property, and that's where the running time comes from. Because inserting and deleting in an array is constant time. Right? If you want to insert, you could just stick it at the end, and if you want to delete, again, as we said, we can just swap, you know, we can swap the root with, with the end and then just decrement the size. Yeah, everyone following me? Okay. So, 
let, let me just go over extract max through a picture. And then once I go over this picture, I'll actually write down some pseudo codes. And as I said, this is going to be one of the test questions. So um, pay attention. We should pay attention regardless, but whatever. OK. <coughs> so let's say we start with this heap over here. Right, so this is a valid heap. 42 has children, 25, I guess that should have been, um, is that a third? I guess, okay, that's, that's also correct. So I'll just make it a 30. Okay, so that's 30, uh, 15, and four, one and two, right? So this heap is represented here. Sorry, let me, I think I put in that, I put in that zero because I wanted to show something, but let, let's keep it, a th let's make it a three. So that will be consistent with my next picture. Okay, so how do we delete 42? So swap 42 with the end of the array and decrement the size. So you swap 42 with the end of the array and then decrement size. So now the heap, because the heap only goes up to size, you can assume that everything beyond size you just ignore, like it's null or you know, it's, it, even if it's there, it doesn't matter. So this is what the heap looks like now. Does this make sense? This is what the heap looks like now, but the heap fails the invariant. This property is not true anymore. At how many nodes is this property not true? Yeah, how many nodes is this property not true? Yeah. Two, which two? <coughs> 25 and three? No, it's true for 25 because it's bigger than its children. Three is bigger than, so yeah, I guess I mean that at which node is it not bigger than its children? And there's, there's actually just one node where things fail, which is exactly the node that you changed makes sense, right? Because everything else was a heap before. So there's one node where things fail. And that is the node two. So now we need to do a series of fixes to make this a heap again. So what we'll do is you look at the children, 25 and three, and you swap two with the larger child, right? So you swap 25 and two. Now there's still a problem. So you've kind of the problem was here. After the swap, the problem moves over there. Then you look at the bigger child here, so it's 15, you swap with two, and you end up with, with this. This has no problem anymore. So in some sense, once the problem gets pushed down to a leaf, it's not a problem anymore, right? Because a leaf has no child. So in this way, the problem is kind of pushed down all the way to the leaves, at which point it's not a problem anymore. And now what we have is a heap again. If you look at what the array looks like at this point, the array has changed quite significantly. Right, so the array now looks like 25, 15, three, two, four, one. Does that make sense? Because you read it off in order. So this array, it started with this and it looks like this. So it's a very, if you, if you were to look at the array, it kind of makes no sense what the change actually is. You have to look at it with respect to it being a tree and then it starts to make some sense. Yes, no, yeah? No, it does not matter. So the order amongst these doesn't matter, the order amongst these doesn't matter. Note that like four is actually bigger than three, even though four is one level below three, right? So in this case, for example, or even if you go back to this example, 15 and four are both more than three. So you could have one entire subtree be larger than like, you know, the root of this other subtree, yes? What do you mean? 
So the array doesn't, it, it, the array is just like, it's not maintaining any empty spaces or pointers, right? It's just like, this is the, f this is A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, A6, A7, so on and so forth. It would so keep it would never keep, so it never does that because if you, okay, so that's a, that's a good question. So the, if you think about, you're asking like, could it look something like this? Could it look like that? No, because this picture that I've drawn here is just the interpretation of the array. The array will always take the array and fill it up level by level. So this picture is something that we only have in our head. The code doesn't deal with it. The code is just looking at an array and just swapping it in between. Am I making sense here? Yes? No, you don't save anything. So it's just an array. Okay, you'll see when I, when I write the code for extract max, I think maybe it'll make more sense. The point is, suppose there were more values here. Um, I'm just gonna put some numbers here. Uh, 15, 10, eight, two, three. If you were to convert this into this picture, so we have 15, 4, 1, and 2. The 10 is going to go there. The 8 goes there. The 2 will go here. And the 3 goes there. There is no filling up the children of 10 and 8 until all the children of the previous level get filled up. This is, I mean, this is a common point of confusion because, again, as I say, the data structure is simply maintaining an array with no empty spaces. The code is also just going to manipulate indices of the array. The way we interpret it on paper is as a tree. But you'll see that the actual code doesn't deal with any aspect of the tree explicitly. Yeah. Um, like un unless we move to like a ternary computer where you had like zero, one, and two as as your whatever uh, the op no I, I yeah uh, the the point of maintaining it m making it binary is that well okay so this is uh, getting a little beyond uh, what we need to do but still okay so it's worth talking about that so note that um, we can go to children by just you know dividing, oh sorry, parents by dividing by two and children by multiplying by two and adding one, which in terms of bit operations is really quick. Because if you wanna divide by two and take the floor, what you're doing is just, you're just shifting, right? And if you're multiplying by two again, you're shifting, you're shifting left and then adding one or zero. So those bit operations are very fast and because of that, this is optimized for a bit representation. You could do this with a ternary, but then that would assume that you have quick ternary operations. Okay, all right, so um, let's, yeah, maybe let me keep this, let me keep this picture up here, and then let me now start doing a little bit of writing. Okay, so this is often, there are two names given to this. Uh, this is sometimes called the sink, sinking. Because if you think about what's happening here, a low priority key sinks to the bottom. So sinking of low priority. And in CLRS, the textbook, this is also called, this, is, this function is called heapify. So let me kind of explain how this goes. So I'm just gonna call this sync, okay? Although I think in my code, the way I've written it, I might call it heapify. They're both the same thing. So, so it's heapify or sync, whichever name you want to give. The input it takes is an index. So with respect to the array, it's just taking as input an index. Right? So think of it like you have some class heap and this is some method in that heap. Heapify or sync. So, Okay, I, I'll actually just call it heapify and not sync because this is consistent with 
with the code I've written. So Heapify assumes that the subheaps rooted at the children of index are correct heaps, but there might, no, I should say there might, there might be a problem at index. So the way to think about this over here is if you call heapify of one, that's the index one. So the, this is the index. We're saying that in the subheaps, there is no problem. These are valid heaps, but there is a potential problem here. So what heapify does is heapify will fix the problem and end end up with a valid heap, okay? So maybe um, to give maybe a more formal uh, a pictorial description and then I'll, I'll write the code. So the idea is that Heapify is gonna call at some index. So let's say this index is i. What we're assuming is that over here, these are valid heaps, but AI might be uh, smaller, or AI dot T might be smaller than the children T. Does that make sense? So this is what is being assumed by this procedure. So this comes up now as we do these data structures with invariants. We have to be a little careful. Heapify is not gonna fix any arbitrary problem. It fixes a very specific kind of problem, which is a problem at a single node where the children don't have any problem. Like the child subheaps are all fine. So let me just write something down. Let me now start writing some, some pseudocode here. <coughs> so at this stage, I'm gonna now, instead of, my pseudocode is gonna look more and more and more like English and less like code, because as you're getting, as you're progressing in the course, hopefully that process of converting the ideas to code is becoming clearer. Again, I will share code with you that does everything else in a heap but this function, right? So this is something that you're gonna have to write yourself. Um, and then you can use my heap box, like code it up over there, test it out and run it. Draw lots of pictures, okay? So the problem is I can print out, in my code I print out the array, but you're gonna have to take it and then draw it out like a heap to make sure that you're doing the heap operations correct because I didn't go through the pain of doing ASCII art to draw, to print out the tree of them in this form. Has, has anyone used that uh, for homework too, the, the code that prints the queens, the Java code? No, nobody used it? Yeah, you did. It's pretty funky, isn't it? Yeah, see? Well, okay, I asked her, so obviously she has to nod, but, but still, yeah, someone else had a question, yeah. How to use it? I mean, there are instructions there. It basically, it's just a job, I think, you just, I'm pretty sure that I must, the readme has instructions, or some of their instructions that say, you just run the Java code, and uh, if you do Java, whatever that class name is, I forget what it's called, and you give it a file with the list of queens, list of your queen positions, it'll actually print a chessboard onto the console with queens at the right position, so you can look at it and see if it makes sense. Okay, so uh, where are we? Yes, okay. So let me write out this procedure, heapify, which takes as input an index, okay? 
Okay? So this is also called sinking. So the first step is if A of index is a leaf, then we're done. This is the base case. Right? Because you cannot have any problems at a leaf because a leaf has no children. Right? So if you don't have children, you don't have any problems. Right? So that's like, you don't have children, most of you. So obviously, this isn't funny. But, but I do. So, okay. All right. So the second step, the second step is we say if a of index dot t is at least the max of a of two times index dot key, sorry, or a of two times index plus one dot t. Well, then we're done. It's already a heap. There's no problem, right? Because the, the value at the parent is at least the value of the children. If you write this code as is, you'll probably get an exception because you have to make sure that these are non null. So be careful. Right? Be careful with, with this. So you might get an exception in some cases. So be careful. That's why I'm not writing it out. I'm warning you. When you do it, you have to be careful to make sure that none of those indices are null, that they go, or rather, they go outside the size. Okay? So that's an extra check that you need to maintain. So that's. Step three, find the index, find the child of A index with the larger key. So we're assuming that if you're at this step, if you're at step three, then A index dot key must be less than the maximum. Means that it's less than one of the children Call this child J. Okay. Then what we'll do is we'll swap A index and A of J. And finally, for the last line of code, this is where I'm going to ask you what the right line is. Okay, so the question is, what is the next? What is the next line of code? Is it heapify at index? Is it heapify of two times index? Or is it heapify at j? Sorry, can everyone read uh, what's on the screen? Is this clear? OK, right? So all right, I'll give you a few minutes to think about it. So remember this picture that I drew here. Okay, so what is the answer? Okay. So, someone has a green teddy bear. That's that's good. So that's right. It's heapify of J. Right? Because once you, so let me go back to, to this picture here. If you have a problem at I or at index, you find out the child with the larger key, so suppose that was j. You swap these two. And then the problem has been pushed one level down, so you call heapify now at j. 
right? So the problem goes down level by level. Right, is it clear? Yes, no? Time to ask questions. Yes. Good. So think of it as, um, let's go back to, to this picture here. So initially, this was index. So index was initially 1. What is the value of j in this picture with respect to this code? It's the node with 25. What is the index of that node? 2, right? So j was equal to 2. Then we swap 25 and 2. So we get this picture. So the problem has now moved to 2. So we call heapify on 2, not on 1. Does that make sense? So if you call heapify on 1 on the same node, you would end up in an infinite loop, right? Because in some sense, it would just keep calling itself. But does it make sense? So the problem has moved to the child. And so then you call heapify at the child. Yes? Uh, you're right. It wouldn't be an infinite loop. It would actually, it would just make one call and then end up with an incorrect heap. I'm sorry. You're right. Absolutely. Yes. So it wouldn't be an infinite loop. If you actually call heapify, that's a good, that's a good test question, right? So suppose you call heapify of index here, what would happen? So if you call heapify back at 25, it would just go and terminate, right? Because now heap of 25 is greater than 2 and 2. The problem is that there is a prop, the issue is that there's a problem with 2 which has not been fixed. Good. Yes? Okay. Yeah. He's already telling you how to do the test question. So let's, let's end this conversation. But yes, that's the, yes, you need to figure that out, right? So yes, you have to compare things with the size because the size is the bound. And so you have to be careful in all of these to make sure that you're never going out of bounds. That is typically where the implementation of a heap where mistakes happen. Or even when I wrote the code first time, I had, a, I had an error because I, was, I forgot to check with the size somewhere. So please check with the size at each point to make sure. And again, sometimes your code might just run because you've deleted various elements and there are things that are not part of the heap that look like they're in the heaps, always print out the array and make sure that it looks correct. Right? That's the way to do it. So the way to do these data structures is even though it might, even though whatever I'm lecturing might make sense, you have to go back and draw the pictures yourself and make sure that you can reconstruct this procedure as well. Okay? So you first reconstru reconstruct it on paper, then you do it in code and make sure that whatever you do on paper is the same as you do in code. I will share a visualization that's there online, which is quite useful. And, um, but I is this clear? So this is how you extract the maximum. Or you actually, this is how you can, technically you can delete any node with a pointer. Right? Because you would just swap with anything and then you could call heapify. So let me just write down over here. Oh, so sorry, second question. No, first question actually. What is the running time of heapify? Given this code, how do you determine the running time? So just to, obviously this step is just O of one, constant time. This step is O of one, this step is O of one, this step is O of one, but now we have recursion. Yeah? Log n, why? Exactly, so all of these are valid reasons and it's good to have many different ways of seeing why the answer is log n. So um, the answer one is of course that, let me go back to this. 
there are at most log n levels of the tree. You can observe that whenever you do a swap, you push the problem down by one level. Right? So you're going to make at most log n calls. It's one argument. The other argument, which the most latest argument, which I prefer, is a little more formal, is it says that at every step, at every call, going back to the notation here, j is either 2 times index or 2 times index plus 1, because those are the indices of the children, right? Which means that j is at least 2 times index at all calls, which means after, let's say, k calls, j, or actually I'll say that the index, so you know, once j gets set to 2 times index, in the recursive call, then index gets set to that, right? So index is doubling each time, at least. The index is at least 2 times k. Make sense? After you make k recursive calls, after k recursive calls. So how many calls to end? So when index is greater than n, we reach the base case. Again, this is the size. So again, we have this sort of this 2 to the k is equal to n. This equation comes up again. Right? So you see this over and over and over again. Right? It's the same whether it's binary search or binary heaps. This logic is how you track the recursion. You say, look, j is going to be at least 2 times the index. And so when I make the next call, the next j is going to be 2 times that and 2 times that. So the index keeps doubling each time and it can double at most log n times before you reach the end of the array. Does that make sense? Right? So again, you can also just look at the levels of the tree and say, look, there are those, those many levels, but I want you to understand it from both sides. Okay? All right. <coughs> and so then how do you do an extract max? So the extract max is pretty straightforward now. So we basically swap a uh, one with a size. Then you decrement size. So this is like the deletion. And then you just call heapify at the index one. Clear? Questions? Yeah. It's a good question. So uh, technically, you want access to it. So you can see that you will have access to it at A of size plus 1. So you could return, you could return the object over there. So you could decrement size. You could um, call heapify1, and then you can return a of size plus one. Yeah? No, no. So nothing, so in some sense, all of this is just manipulating an array. So there's no, there, there are no pointers, there's no linked list here. If you look at, this code here, it's basically just swapping a bunch of elements of the array with some strange way of indexing by going like two times the index and two times the index plus one. So again, as I said, when you look at this code, there are no pointers mentioned here. Even child is just a way that we interpret the indices. It's just taking an array and moving things, in, moving things around in an array in some strange fashion. Yes, is this, is this clear? Yeah. Why do you call Over here? Yeah. Because you've swapped. Okay, so this is going back to this picture here. 
So remember, this, this was the heap we started off with. Right, so ignore this part. How do we delete the maximum? We're going to swap 42 with 2. So 2 is going to go to the root now. So you end up with this picture here, right? But now this is not a heap because 2 has a problem with its children. So you have to call heapify to fix the problem there. And then 2 will then start moving down. It will sink to the bottom. So whenever you do a swap in the array, you've created a potential problem somewhere, so you call heapify to fix the problem. Make sense? Yes? So are you saying that you guys can do more than one time to do that? Um, like remove as in make it null? It's still in the array. So um, you'll see that there is, a, there, uh, there is a use case for that. There is a use case for that. Um, yes? You're returning what A1 was, exactly. Exactly. I mean, you could store A1 and then just return that. But I'm writing it this way to tell you that it's, it's still in the array but it's sort of out of bounds. So it's not going to change the size of the heap? Size, so think of, okay, so think of what your class heap has. Right, it's going to have, let's say, some uh, a, and it's going to have some int called size. And so when you initially initialize the constructor, when you call the constructor, you would set the size of the array to be much more than what it should, you know, than the number of elements you hope to see. Technically, you have to do it dynamically then, right? So there's all of that which I don't want to get into and you don't need to get into in the code that I've given. So initially, I'm going to construct the array maybe with like a thousand. And if size ever crosses a thousand, then I have to sort of double things. Sure, yeah, those are like implementation details which, yeah, you can usually, you don't have to necessarily make it a power of three, though. Well, it, it really doesn't matter because it, it all depends on size, and size might not be a power of two anymore. Yes? That's true, if, yeah, so then you would have to store A1 and then return it instead, as opposed to doing that. Okay? So again, as I, I'll repeat again, the way to think of a heap is these two pictures here, right? This is what the computer sees and this is the way we interpret it. But from the computer's perspective, it's really just that. This is different from a linked list where like, you know, the pointers that you draw are explicitly represented as, as addresses, right? Here, there is no representation of these other than us manipulating the indices. It's, this has a name, I forgot the name, but it's like some kind of implicit representation or something, where essentially, you're just, you just have an array, but you know, we will mathematically interpret it in this way. Okay, so again, like, I mean, maybe this is making some sense, which is good. But the way to really understand it is to draw out a bunch of examples and work it out yourself. Again, I'll share a visualization that does it for you, but I want you to do it yourself because only then will you really understand how the operations work. Then you code it up. Don't try to code it up without making sure that you have the pictures down correctly. Okay? And again, just, you know, you could say start with it, start with this heap, like whatever heap I've given, just do a bunch of extract maxes and inserts, and you'll see how the array keeps changing. All right, so this was the procedure heapify, which takes care of extract max, which, and this is again running an O log n. It's also theta log n, but then I have to show you an example where it will take at least log n steps, and I, you know, I'm not gonna do that. Let's not worry about that, but you can prove that it's actually theta of log n. There are examples where it takes log n steps. Okay. So the next, question is how do you insert? And so an insert, instead of the sync operation, this is called a swim operation. Because what will happen is that large keys will go to the root. So let's, 
again, take my the heap example that I've given there. Yeah, I'm not going to have this part here, so just <coughs> up to there, excuse me, <coughs> 25, 3, 15, 4, 1, 2, which is as represented as an array, it's 42, 25, 3, 15, 4, 1, and 2. And so now we need to insert another element. And suppose I insert over here 100. Right? So what that means is with respect to this picture, I put in 100 over here. <coughs> yes? Yes? So, because I decremented size. Right. So, this is technically out of bounds of what you have. Yeah. <coughs> Actually, this isn't the best example. Um, <coughs> ah, what the heck, let's, let's keep it and then we'll proceed. Okay, so in this case, it's actually kind of obvious what should happen to 100, right? 100 has to go to the root. So the swim operation is quite simple. Look at the parent, and if it's larger, swap. So you just keep swapping with the parents until you, until you get to the point where you should be. So the reason, uh, let me do 40 instead. Okay. <coughs> so where should 40 end up? Actually, le let me ask this question. question, right? Where? should 40 end up? It's going to end up at A of 1. It's going to end up at A of 2. Or does it end up at A of 4? So you should be able to work this out. It's not too bad. Right, which index does it end up at? Written in red, so it's. Yeah, I'm looking at it because it's like it's like not written in red. It's like 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 it's Okay, does, do you see what the answer is? Good, it's mostly blue, yes. So 40 has to end up at that position, right? Because it's not gonna go to the root because it's not the largest element. And so it's gonna swap with 15, then swap with 25, and then look at 42 and say I'm less than 42 and not swap. Right, so the swim operation is even easier to think about. It just keeps swapping with the parent until it ends up at the right position. Yeah, questions, is this clear? Yes. G yes, you always insert at the end. So again, the way to think about both insert and delete is that the first operation is to treat it as an array. So in an array, in an unsorted array, you insert at the end, and you delete by just swapping with the end. So you do that, and then you perform a series of operations to fix it. So you, I mean, you keep track of size. So you would insert at the index size, size plus one, because size decrements on a delete, right? So you would insert at size plus one. Does that make sense? You just overwrite the value because it, you've deleted it, right? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, you're overwriting the value when you insert, which makes sense. That's why you would return this so that you can process it later on. But somebody asked, why would you keep it at that position? And I'll show you an example where you only do, well, you'll see, you'll see. Okay, so where does 40 end up? It ends up at A2, right? So once you insert 40, it looks like this, 40. So this, the right portion of the heap remains as is. and 15, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so now suppose I insert, I insert 35. So what's going to happen is, I'm gonna put 35 here. Now this is not a correct heap. Again, I'm gonna ask you, what is the final position? I'll give you three options. I want you to work it out. Make sure that you can work out these examples. The final position, the final position of 35, is it going to be a two? It's gonna be a three? Or is it gonna be a four? Where is it gonna end up? Right, make sense? Okay, so what is the what is the final index? Green, exactly. So it is A4 because 35 will swap with 25 and then just stay there. Right? Because 35, once 35 reaches there, it's less than 40. Make sense? Yeah. Again, with the heap, once you draw a few pictures, I'm sure that if you spend like maybe half an hour to 45 minutes just drawing a bunch of examples. It should make it should be clear. It's you know. Um, so let's write out the code for the insert operation. So I will call this the swim operation. And again, swim is going to take an index and I. So here is. There may be a problem. between AI and AI's parents. I'll spare you the children and parent jokes by now because it's, it gets old. So if I is equal to one, then what? Yes, that's your base case. What do you do? Return. Right, because then I doesn't have a parent. So obviously this is vacuous. This is the base case. If AI dot key is uh, at most A of the floor of I over two dot key return because there is no problem. Otherwise, what you do is you swap AI with A of I over two, so swap with the parent, and then you call swim on the floor of I over two. Again, I'm writing floor explicitly in the code. You don't need to take floors because when you divide by two, it's automatically the floor, but I'm doing that because I want you to see that it's, it's a floor, right? So this is even easier than the extract max and the deletion process because all you do is just halve the index each time. Again, you, you see this, uh, 
equation that after k calls, i will be something like, at most, n divided by 2 to the k. Right? The index will be at most, because every time you have the index, how many times can you have an index? Log n, right? So always this logic of having something from n going to 1 or doubling from 1 going to n. Right? This is how you get to log n. Okay, makes sense? So the running time, time is O of log n. And again, you have to, you can prove theta bounds, but then you have to show an example where it actually takes that much time. It's a little more complicated, but, but the O bound is really easy to see. Yes? Exactly, yeah. When you insert the largest number, then it goes all the way up, yeah. But it, well, it's not complicated, but you still have to think about that case. Whereas with this, it's like, it's just, exactly. So inserting the largest, and uh, in the case of the opposite, when, when does extract max take the longest? It's when the smallest element goes up to the root, and it goes down. Okay. All right, so this is the swim operation to insert. Let's say you want to insert some object then first what we'll do is we'll increment size. We'll set A of size is equal to this object, and then we call the swim operation on the size. Right? So that gives you your insert. It's kind of similar. There's a parallel between that and the extract max, which is, you know, you Basically, you modify the size, you either remove an element or put the element, and then you either call heapify, which is the sink operation, and then insert, it's the swim operation. And they're both, they both take log n time. So there are parallels between both of these, and that then gives us this line of the table here, right? Insert, find max, extract max. I didn't tell you about increase key, but it's pretty much the same logic. If you take any node and you increase the key, again, you can call the swim operation to push it up. Right? Okay, so this is a good time. Yeah. It's, it's a, yeah, in this case, it's a special case of insert. It turns out that there are certain data structures where you can actually, like, make this lower, even though the insert is more expensive. So there are more complicated heaps called like Fibonacci heaps and, spin and binomial heaps where you can kind of play with those things as well. But for the sake of a binary heap or priority queues, and as far as I understand, I think the priority queue built into the STL library of C++ is a binary heap. Okay, so let's take a break for a few minutes, and then when we come back, I'll tell you about sorting with a heap.
All right, uh, let's, get, uh, let's get back to heaps. And by the way, so multiple people have asked me about makeups for the tests and how that will work. So I haven't deliberately figured out a policy yet. I just want to see how things proceed. What will likely happen is that I will just combine test one and test two, all the questions into maybe another makeup test, where in one of the sections that is currently free, you can go in and you can just try it again. And um, I will likely give an opportunity to resubmit homeworks one and two for those of you who are, you know, who weren't able to get it. My aim is for you, so if you can basically understand tests one, two, and three, which is about heaps and, uh, heaps and binary search trees, and you can do some portion of homeworks one and two, that should get you to a B. So I will give you an opportunity to make that up, right? So, so don't worry about it. What, what to me is important is that by the time the course ends, I would like you to be able to write all that code. Like not in an hour, but to be able to write all of it or to have written all of it yourself. Does that make question? Yes? Clear? Okay. So <clears throat> what is, and again, I emphasize what is really important for those of you who are going to be in the computer science major is to know all these data structures, know all the running times, and to be able to code them up. Right? Like that's like, that's, once you have that, you'll find your path forward will be much easier. So you need to be able to write all those data structures from scratch, write all those functions that I gave you, and have some understanding of what the big O running time for each of the operations are, right? Okay. Okay, so let me tell you about, so most of you have seen uh, sorting algorithms that run in, in n log n, but you might not have seen this one. This is a, it's called, Focus, it's called heap sort. So the first step is, so a, a is just an array. An array of n elements. So what we'll do is, first thing we'll do is we'll convert a into a binary heap. So what does that mean? It means that initially, the heap property isn't maintained anywhere. It's just an array. We'll convert that into a binary heap. How can you do that? You could just insert all the elements of A into a heap, right? You just insert all the elements one by one. I'll show you a better way of doing it, but you could just insert all the elements then you simply run extract max n times. And then you could just return the array A. So this is where some, you know, people who are asked, what is the point of storing the max at the end? You'll see that this automatically sorts the array for you. Because what happens is, so initially, let's just say this is your array. This is A. Now you have to shuffle things around and make that a heap. You have to do the first step, which you can do by basically calling like the swim operation a bunch of times. All right, so all you do is you keep going, you call swim, swim, swim. It's like insert this, then insert this, then insert this, so on and so forth. You could just call insert n times. Does that make sense? Once you're done with the inserts, this is now a heap, but it's not in sorted order. But if you call extract max, so initially the max is here. So when you call extract max, note that the max is gonna end up here and the second max is gonna be there, right? Because the heap always maintains a property that the maximum is at the root and once you extract the max, we move the max to the end of the array, we decrement size, so size is here, and second max is here. And then when you call extract max again, the second max is gonna end up there, and the third max is at the beginning, so on and so forth, right? So it's pretty neat, so it automatically gives you the sorted order if you call extract max n times. That sort of, yes?
uh, recurs through how? Wh which is exactly what this is doing. It's just think of this as this is an implementation of a sorting algorithm. Like you just, instead of actually, you know, writing a separate heap class, you could just write the code, well, okay, you could do that. But the point is this is, um, it's just a convenient way of getting the sorted order. But you can also extract and move it somewhere else, which it gives it to you. Uh, yes? Say that again. So that was the equivalent of spaghetti code, what you just said. So I'm not sure. So <laughs> let me see if I understand you correctly. The first part converts A into a heap. So that's where you did all the swim. When you do extract max, you're only doing syncing. Good, okay, so good. good. So let me show you a way, a way in which you don't need to copy the element. But you, you can copy the elements into a separate heap, and that would work. But if, think about if you simply iterated over this array and you call the swim operation at each step, you would end up with you would end up with a, with a heap. Does that make sense? It, it takes a little bit of thinking about like that. You can always create a new heap and just insert into that new heap. But you don't really need that extra memory. You can do it with just this memory. Does that answer your question? Okay. So let me just give this argument. So the max is here now. When you do extract max again, the second max ends up here. Size goes down. And this is the third max, so on and so forth. So when you call extract max n times, you end up with a sorted array, right? And this runs in O of n log n because each extract max runs in log n times. So this is another way of getting n log n sorting. Yeah? Well, you just do it, n if you know that they have n times, then you just do it with n. No, it's the heap extract max, because this is a heap now. So it's, okay, so here's the weird thing, right? You start with an array. You imagine it's a heap. So you swap things around in that array so it looks like a heap. And then you call extract max on that heap, and the array gets sorted. So it's, it's, it's like a, it's a, so let me, uh, yes. Good question, good, uh, yes, right? Because you can insert n times. So you can do this in O of n log n, but I'm gonna show that you can do even better than that, but we'll get there, yes, right? So, but does this, yes, in the back. Well, you basically you wanna sort the array, right? And the way that I'm gonna sort the array is by converting the array to look like a heap and then just calling extract max n times. Otherwise, how would you call extract max on it and r make it run in log n times? So you want to find, you want to be able to extract the maximum quickly. If the array was just an arbitrary array, you have to loop through the whole thing to find the maximum. But when it's a heap, the maximum is always at the beginning. And so you can always find the maximum but then you need to swap things around so that the third maximum comes, and when it's a heap, that becomes easy. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, so I don't like to call it sorted, because it's sorted means that it's either going increasing or decreasing. When it's a heap, it means that it has that invariant that, again, let's just, uh, this is, it, it's a bit confusing. You have to think about it carefully because a heap just means this property. 
Sorted means that ai dot key is less than ai plus one dot key. That's what sorted means. Heap means that it has this weird property. But when this weird property holds, then the maximum can be found quickly and extracted quickly. Extracted so that this property holds after the deletion. So this, is what defines the heap. this is what defines a heap, exactly. This is a heap, right? Just like for sorted, again, I'll say this again, for sorted, if you say for all i, ai dot key is less than or equal to ai plus one dot key, that means it's sorted. So you want to convert an array that satisfies no properties to an array that satisfies these properties to an array that satisfies the sorted properties. And that can be done in n log n. This is a pretty fast sorting algorithm. I haven't compared it head to head, but apparently it's better than merge sort. It's faster than merge sort. Even though they're all n log n, but the constants are better. Okay? Yes? At the end, you don't care about the size. You just wanted to sort the array. The size will actually become zero at the end. Yeah. So it's like you're not actually using this as a proper priority here. You're just kind of using it to sort. Once you sort, you know, you're done. You don't care. Yeah. Yes. Good. Yeah. Well, at that point, technically, the heap becomes empty because size is zero now. And all of these properties only hold for i less than size, right? Because otherwise, beyond that, you're, you're assuming that it's only the portion up to size that's a heap. So it's being done a little carefully, right? Because like it's kind of melding the array and the heap and all together and, and maintaining some things less than size and so on and so forth. But this is, this is heap sort. Yeah? Yes. The elements end up here. Heck, I'm going to do an example together. Yeah. So let's start with an arbitrary array and let's go through this as an example. Okay. So, uh, no, let's put seven elements. Okay, so uh, we'll always start with 42, uh, 100, no, 10, 107, 9, 63, 5, and uh, 12. Okay, so this is obviously, it's not a heap, because if you were to draw it as a heap, this is just some array, because if you draw it as a heap, so let's just draw it as a heap, 42, 10, 107, Nine, um, sixty-three, five, twelve. Let me not make it a power of two, and uh, twenty-five. Okay. Or let me not make it fully binary. So okay. So this is this is not a heap. Is that clear? How will you convert this into a heap? Using the operation, the sink and swim operations that we've discussed so far. How would you convert it to a heap? Yeah? Sorry, say that again? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Or another way of doing that is to just call swim. So you've already done the size increment in this, this part, sort of, automatically. You just keep calling swim, right? So you can call swim at 42, nothing happens. Call swim at 10. Next time we go 42, 9, 63. Uh, no, sorry, what am I saying? Of course not. Sorry, yes. Good. Whoever that was, that person was awake. Good. So you call swim there, nothing happens. Then you call swim here. So 107 swaps with the 42. 
107. Ah, 10, 10. 42, 5, 12, 9, 63, 25. Right, then you'll call swim here. Does that make sense? So you just keep calling swim one by one. But that's, like, that's basically inserting. So when you finally finish this, I'm not going to draw all the intermediate steps. Uh, what's going to happen is that 63 is going to end up over there. 42, 5, 12. Um, what happens? This is going to go, this is going to become 10, 25, 9. I, yeah, this is correct. So this is what happens after calling all swim. Right? You call swim from every single node. How much did time did that take? It took O of n log n. So what you have now is a heap. So we've converted this array into this new array. Well, it's not a new array. It's the same array, really. But I've just reordered the elements so that it looks like this. So it's like a completely different ordering. But it's a heap ordering. It's not a sorted ordering. It's a heap ordering. Now I can do extract max n times on this. And it's going to put everything in sorted order. Does that, does that make sense? So it's going to swap the 107 with the 9. And then it's going to call sync on 9. And then so sync on, actually, on the index 1, so on and so forth. Yes, yes. Yeah, you would have to shift the elements by one initially at the beginning. I mean, or if you wanted, it, you could go back to the heap and you could start things at zero and then rework the indices. Depends on like, how you want to implement, yeah. Yeah, someone else had their hand up? No. OK, so <clears throat> as if that wasn't complicated enough, now I have like the real complicated thing to tell you. This process, how do you convert A into a binary heap? Right? So what we did is we called swim everywhere in order. Okay, so let me write that down. Convert A into a binary heap. What we did was for i going from 1 to n, we called uh, swim of i. So this takes O of n log n time. OK? Does that make sense? Right? It's what we did over here. Yes? Yes, you don't need to call it for i equals 1. But it would still, yeah, so, right, because that would just terminate immediately. You can also do the following. And this is not as obvious to see. So for i going from n to 1, go in the opposite direction and do a sync. Right? What that says is instead of trying to push things up, you also can push things downwards, and the idea will still work. So what happens is you call sync here, nothing happens. Sync there, nothing happens. Sync, sync, sync the 9. So the 9 will swap with the 25. So everything over here is fixed now. Then you call sync over there, sync there, so on and so forth. So you can call sync in reverse order. Does that make sense? This is not, so how long does this take? You might say, well, this also takes n log n, because every sync takes log n. But actually, it turns out that this runs in O of n. Because most of the sync operations are actually really fast. So you have to kind of carefully do the math on this one, yeah? Heapify was the sync. Sorry, this. Heapify, sorry. Which is the same thing as syncing. 
right? Because what Heapify does is it pushes the problems below. And Swim kind of, you know, or rather, I shouldn't say push, yeah. So what Heapify does, it says if there's a problem at a node, you push it below and keep pushing it below until there's no problem left. So what happens in this case is most of the Heapify operations are down here and they're all really fast. To prove this, it takes a little bit of more careful math. It's given in CLRS. But uh, this is called the build heap procedure. Meaning starting with an A, array A, how do you convert to a binary heap? Again, the first one for i equals one to n calling swim, this works, but it runs an n log n in the worst case. If you call heapify in the opposite direction, now I recommend that you go and do it on this. Run the heapify procedure and see what you end up with. And that will give you, th that will give you a different sort of, it'll actually give you a different heap. Yeah? No, it won't, no, no. It actually, yeah, if you go from, it, actually if you go from one to n, it, it won't work. Because heapify assumes that the children are correct heaps. So that's why you have to go in reverse order. The same thing for the swim operation. Right, in the swim you assume that everything above is correct. In the heapify you assume everything below is correct. And that's why you reverse the order in those two. Yes? Sync and Heapify are the same thing. Um, it's a little annoying that, I mean the reason I use Heapify is because if someone were to re refer to the book, CLRS, that's the language they give there. Um, and then I was just too lazy to change the name because I was afraid the grading script might break somewhere and I haven't checked something, so. But yes, yeah, Sync and Heapify are the same thing. So again, Heapify or Sync is, just to remind you, show you the code again. Right, so Heapify assumes that the subheaps are correct heaps. So the children are all correct and it pushes the problem below, right? So this is the build heap procedure. Even if you don't understand how exactly it works, it's important that you know this fact. A heap can be built in linear time, yeah? Heapify actually, so Heapify takes, um, so let me show you the code for that. Heapify basically just takes an index. It's the, it's when you do the extract max that you call Heapify at the root, right? But otherwise you can call Heapify at any index because it is a recursive procedure. Okay. Okay, so just to sort of end this picture here, I'm gonna write this here, build heap is actually linear. You can do it in n log n, but if you do it in this way, you can actually do it in linear time, in O of n time, by doing it this way. I didn't prove to you why this is linear, but you, know, but you can kind of, I mean, the, the math is a little bit more complicated on that. You have to observe that some of the heapifies are, really, most of them are really quick. And it's only the ones towards the root that take a long time. You have to work the math out. But these sort of, you can even ignore the increase key. These four flying times, this is what you need to know, right? And the first three, you shouldn't really get it. So this ends our discussion on binary heaps. Are there any questions? Questions. Okay. So, yes. Swim and Heapify. So, <coughs> swim. So think of. Um, so let me. So all my. Let's see the picture there. Okay, so what swim does is it keeps swapping with the parent. So swim says take something with high priority and move it up. Heapify or sync 
is take something with low priority and move it down. So when you want to insert something, you insert something and then it has to move up to the right position. When you extract the max, the max gets out. So somebody else takes the max's position. That has to go down to its position, right? So again, when you delete, you have to move down. You have to, whatever change then moves downwards. When you insert, it moves upwards. And this is the sink and swim. Both of these, the running time is simply the number of levels of the heap, which is just log n. Sorry, the omega bounds for. It's omega n. No, no, but if it's O of n, it cannot be omega n log n, right? Because omega is a lower bound on the worst case. If you know the worst case is at most n, then the lower bound is also n. And that is trivially n because you have to read everything. You need at least a for loop to look at the elements. Right? So the point is building a heap can be done in n. Although the obvious way of doing it would be n log n because you would do a bunch of inserts, but it's a quicker way of doing it. But these are the operations of a heap. Yes? You can't do heapify from one to n because heapify assumes that the subheaps rooted at the children are also correct. If you start with an arbitrary, uh, arbitrary array, the children might not be correct subheaps. You don't, so the thing is you don't do any swims in this. Okay, so I hope I, there is no swim. You just started with an array and you just call heapify. They're two separate procedures. They're two different procedures. Once you do this, then obviously you don't need to do the second one and vice versa. They're two different ways. The obvious way is less efficient and this way is more efficient. They both construct heaps. They may construct slightly different heaps. But yes? Good question. The running time of heap sort doesn't depend on either of these, and I'll show you why. That's a good question. So let me, sorry, my, my pages are like all over the place. I don't even know where it is. What? In heap sort, the second step takes O of n log n anyway. So even if the first step is faster, it's still n log n. Right? Because it's like n log n plus n, which is still O of n log n. It's a good question. But the constant factor will change. It's faster to do, you know. What will happen is that step two dominates your running time, so it doesn't matter. Any other questions? Okay, so you know we have like four minutes left. So obviously I'm not going to launch into something new, but let me per let me just tell you what's going to happen next, just to give you sort of a to prepare you maybe. So we've done binary heaps, and so what is the one operation that you would like that you don't have? Find, you can't find anything, right? There's no way that you can find in a binary heap. And so what you'd like to have is a data structure that does insert, delete, find, find max, find min, and even predecessor and the successor. So predecessor is the largest less than a value and this is the successor is the smallest key larger than a value so you have all of these this is sort of this covers basically all the operations that you would like and so there's a particular data structure that one uses for this which is the binary search tree
okay, or BSTs, and this is probably something that you may be more familiar with, which is your standard binary search tree. And with a careful implementation called a self-balancing BST, all of these operations can be made locked.